Good evening. Welcome to tonight's Night Notes concert. I'm Maury Oaken. I'm the president of Detroit Chamber Winds and Strings. This performance reminds me that our organization has always been about family and friends. The musicians who founded DCWS asked other musical friends to join them, and 40 years of music making ensued. Our families helped us get going in so many ways, initially making cookies and stuffing envelopes, and eventually and always actually providing financial and moral support. Nearly four decades later, we still get to make music with our friends and we're surrounded by an extended family of supporters and music lovers who help make things happen. Our night notes this evening is presented in memory of David King, who was the youngest brother of our DCWS bassoonist, Victoria King, and the brother-in-law of pianist Janice Park, both of whom will perform together throughout tonight's presentation. The concert is sponsored by David Arney and Christine Kuzma. Dave Arney was David King's inseparable inseparable friends since high school. He'll make several remarks before one of the pieces to give you an idea about the person that David King was. So in addition to thanking Christine and Dave for their support, I want to also thank Mary Brevard, Lynn Myers, and Jane Conway for making Night Notes concerts possible this season, and our friends at Crook in the Hills for allowing us to use their beautiful facility. Stay tuned at the concert's conclusion for a Q&A that we'll do with Vic and Janice. You can enter questions into the chat on your screen and we'll pass them along. Now, please enjoy the concert. We are beginning this concert with a very romantic piece for bassoon and piano, premier solo by Eugene Bordeaux. Bordeaux lived from 1850 to 1926 and spent much of his career in Paris, France. This composition was written for the Paris Conservatory. Melodies and Memories is in honor of my brother David and his general love of music. David was the youngest of six kids. With a family full of budding musicians, David attended all of his siblings' band and orchestra concerts. When I was in college, he and my dad attended every concert I played, well, maybe just for the grilled cinnamon rolls that were the tradition after the concerts. I was teaching a summer band camp when David was visiting me. Since he had to go to camp with me, I told him he may as well pick an instrument to learn. He chose the bassoon. So he obviously had great musical taste. As an adult, he enjoyed attending Detroit Chamber Winds concerts and DSO concerts, but he also had a wicked appreciation for the music of Frank Zappa. David, this concert is for you.
Francis Poulenc was a French composer and pianist who lived from 1899 to 1963. As the son of a prosperous manufacturer and a devout Catholic, Poulenc was expected to continue in the family business and was not allowed to enroll in music school. His mother, however, was a capable pianist with repertoire ranging from classical to music that was termed adorable bad music. As a child studying piano, Poulenc was fascinated by the music of Debussy, Schubert, and Stravinsky. Poulenc did not have much formal training in composition, but he was advised by Eric Satie, Ravel, and Mio. The trio for oboe, bassoon, and piano was written between 1924 and 1926, started when he was just 25. It premiered in 1927 with Poulenc as the pianist. The work was praised for its depth and feeling and Mozart-like melodies and was regarded as his first major chamber work. Poulenc dedicated this work to Manuel de Falla, who arranged for the work to be performed in Spain. The trio is in three movements. The first movement starts with a slow introduction, followed by a presto. The second movement is an andante, filled with beautiful melodies. The last movement is a lively rondo. Note that this move, in this movement, the piano does not have a single measure of rest.
was associated with a group of young French composers dubbed the Six. Most notably among them was Arthur Honegger. The Six composers were friends, but their styles varied greatly. Music critics described Poulenc as half monk from his father and half naughty boy from his mother. Composer Ned Roram describes his music as deeply devout and uncontrollably sensual. The Sextet was written in 1932 at the height of his years with the Six. He was not happy with the piece and revised it extensively until 1939. The Sextet is in three movements. Two outer lively movements surround the middle movement which is a divertimento in which you can hear Poulenc's uncompromising adherence to melody. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello, I'm Dave Arney. Today's performance is dedicated to the memory of a very special friend and a very special person, Dave King. Dave and I became close friends early on in high school, and along with a few other friends, bonded over the love of fast cars, music, and girls. Dave was gifted. He had an engineer's mind with the hands of a builder. His talents were most evident in the cars that he built. Shortly after graduating from high school, Dave's life changed abruptly. In what can only be described as a freak bicycle accident, Dave suffered a traumatic brain injury. The extent of the injury so serious that nobody expected him to live through the night. The surgery so radical and complex that if successful, would surely mean that he would live a life of dependency and extreme physical and mental deficits. Well, Dave did live through the night, and he did live through the surgeries and the many other surgeries that were to come. And that's really where Dave's story begins. Against all odds, and with the tireless support of his family and medical team, Dave relearned how to walk, how to talk, and how to do all the simple things that we take for granted each day. His recovery was long and difficult, his handicaps extensive, his ability to engineer and fabricate gone. But a new gift began to reveal itself. It was the gift of relentless positivity, a gift that would affect anyone that would come in contact with him in the years to come. Armed with this new gift and the continued support of his family, Dave held a steady job. He kept meaningful relationships with friends, new and old. He met a girl. He got married. He had a son, Ian, who we would later say was the best thing that he ever did. Dave was living a life. The decades that followed Dave's accident were filled with challenges, joys, and setbacks, just like any other person's. But the devastating injuries that Dave had so miraculously overcame began to catch up with him. His final years, unfortunately, were in a nursing home. His mother, Fran, would visit him and attend to him every day for eight years straight, except on Fridays where she volunteered at the hospital. There was no other better example of unconditional love. My visits with Dave would always end with him giving me a smile and thanking me for coming to see him. A sense of positivity always surrounded our visits. He taught me and others a greater appreciation of what is important and what we should be thankful for. I will always be grateful for that. I'm thankful to the King family for their friendship and for the support over the years and for all the people at the Detroit Chamber Winds and Strings for producing this event. And most of all, I'm thankful for Dave. I'm thankful for his friendship, for introducing me to his family, and teaching me life lessons late in life. Dave, you truly lived the life you almost lost. Thank you. The Planck C minor improvisation was written in 1959, four years before his death. This piano solo was an homage to the French chanson singer Edith Piaf. So the piece has a beautiful singing melody with Planck's signature harmonic language, which has blending bitonality and quick passing dissonances. I enjoy the sophisticated and elegant style of this piece. Since this concert was titled Melodies and Memories, I thought this piece was appropriate. I would like to dedicate the performance not only to our beloved David King, but for anyone who has lost a loved one during this pandemic time. I hope this music will comfort you and bring good memories.
Wow, so beautiful. Thanks so much for, for bringing up those pieces, Janice and Vic. T tell me um, tell me why, it reminded me actually why I love Poulenc so much and tell me why he's at the center of this concert for the two of you. Well, Janice and I wanted to play together and I'm stealing one of her answers because <laughs> She had done the Poulenc sextet at her school on a faculty recital and wanted to do it. So as you know, we were trying to figure out a concert for DCW to schedule it. And usually that's too many people for night notes, but with Dave Arney uh, sponsoring it, it allowed us to put it on night notes. Right. And that, that was the, the centerpiece of the show and everything else got put together from that fell into place. Janice, I know that you're, you're on the faculty at Chapman and in, in, um, in Los Angeles. And those of you who have, those of our listeners who have been watching us for a while know that you performed on Night Notes once before. Actually, it was the concert that was the biggest, the, the best attended Night Notes we ever did with Tom Hooten from the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And so I have two questions about that for you. One is, um, what I, I know you're from Korea. How did you get the Chapman as one? And the other is, I'm curious if you've had a chance to play since with Tom Hooten. Yes. Um, well, I will answer the second one first. Yes. Uh, because of thanks to this WS, uh, I got to perform with the Tom Hutton, and uh, he and I got to perform again at my uh, university, Chapman University. And that concert happened to be the most sold out. And oh, wow. we have to turn away all the people, and they got all <laughs> upset. And we have to put extra raw of it chairs on the stage on the side and still couldn't uh, have everyone so that was a big success um i found chapman university when i came from korea uh, for college um, i went to middle school and high school in korea uh, music and art school it's equivalent to uh, juilliard school here and then i decided to go to um, america uh, for my education for college education and then my aunt was living in la so uh, i went to my aunt's house and then she introduced chapman which has a good music program and also good english uh, ESL program because I had to learn English first. That's how I started. And then I went to uh, my graduate school for USC and then went, came back to Chapman to teach. And I've been teaching there for the last 25 years. So wow. Chapman is in my home away from home. Great. Great. And, and Vic, you know, I was sitting there listening to you play and, you know, I realized that you and I have worked together now for 45 years, you know, and, um, with all of the, all the other wind players probably weren't born when you and I started working together in 1976 or 77, which is pretty astonishing. But I think what's more astonishing about that is it's 45 years later and you still sound great. I know it must be hard to keep that up and to you know, play a solo piece like that is not so easy. Uh, how different is it than playing in the orchestra? Well, in the orchestra, the conductor uh, decides how you're going to play and you have to play with the woodwind players or with the whole orchestra so you don't get to make a lot of decisions so in some respects it's sort of fun to play a solo because you can decide to do it however you want also i play second bassoon so i make second bassoon reads to do all the <sighs> second bassoonists would need to do so to play a solo you have to make more of a first bassoon read and that's kind of a pain but, uh, and by that, you mean the first bassoon read needs to be more bright? Uh, more... No, first bassoon read, first bassoons play more in the uh, oh, middle and upper register, second bassoon, middle and low register, and a lot of lowness and soft, and you can't be sharp because you're the bottom of all the chords and the woodwind sections. So it's yeah. just different skill set. Yeah, well, when we, when we talked earlier, you characterized yourself as the old lady of the orchestra now, right? Yep. Um, <laughs> so I'm wondering how different it is now to play in the DSO, how different the orchestra is actually than when you started in, what, 1982 or something like that? 85 80, maybe? 84. 84. Okay. Um, I think the orchestra actually is better right now. I think the string players are better. Um, uh, a lot of the new woodwinds we have are terrific, um, but our strings are, are very good. Um, 
and now with the otter coming in, he just has a lot of musical energy. That's all I can say. He's filled with ideas and he's got good technique and he knows how to get us to do what he wants us to do. So it's kind of a lot of fun. Great, an exciting moment. Yeah, you've been under, you were hired, hired, by, hired by Herbig, right? So it's Herbig, Navy. Herbig, night and day. I loved Herbig. He did great stuff for the orchestra, but he was very strict, made us play together, made us play soft, very disciplined, but he made some changes in the orchestra that really were wonderful. Um, you know, he was, he was uh, uh, very good for the orchestra. A long time ago. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's hard to believe how much time has passed. Janice, I'm wondering from your perspective, how much chamber music you get to do in in in, in Los Angeles. And do you put on different ears when you're playing by yourself? Your solo piece was so beautiful. I thought that was so wonderful. Thank you. Yes, I love to play chamber music. I, I mean, I'm so grateful to perform with the excellent performers uh, for this concert. And, it's so much fun to collaborate with, with other performers. However, there's big differences, obviously. When I'm playing my solo piece, there's much freedom to just uh, uh, express my emotional interpretation. And But when I'm playing with chamber music, of course, I have to follow their breathing and pause and amount of rubato and retardando and bring out their voicings. And so, but, you know, it's just so much fun to be, uh, playing with other people. So yeah, it was an cool. honor to be uh, part of this concert. Play so beautiful. And for those of you who, who are watching and listening who didn't hear the beginning to, to go back and point out, the two of you are sisters-in-law, right? You're, you're married to, to Vic's older brother, Dan. No, he's my younger brother. Oh, oh <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so you, you have, Vic, Vic, Vic and I both share having six kids. I'm the youngest and Vic's in the middle. Vic, tell me. I'm number two. Number two. Well, in the middle. That's in the middle. And so um, I, I had forgotten that story about David picking the bassoon. Tell me about the your other. I know Val played oboe, right? Uh, who, oboe, bassoon. Dan played trumpet. Doug played trombone. Don had to play piano a little bit before they'd let him play percussion. And um, David played the bassoon for a while. Yeah, I just I couldn't remember the story, and, and we're the reverse. Where I'm the youngest in the family, the the boy came last, and your family, the girls came first, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually sort of the same, but in a different sort of sequence. Yeah, so um, I, I wanted to say how how uh, uh, I was I was fortunate to know your brother, all of your brothers, but especially David at, at this time because he was hanging around so much when we first got together. And I know as we as we go out tonight, I'm going to say thank you for the great. Um, opportunity to get to know your family and to make such wonderful music together for all these years. Um, I did want to, before we go, say a little bit about um, what's coming up next for us. Of course, our office, our organization is involved with the Great Lakes Chamber Music Festival that's starting uh, a week from Sunday. So uh, look on our website or, and you can find out about tickets for that. And the next performance that Detroit Chamber Winds has that's going to be virtual is a, another structurally sound concert that Amanda Blakey is doing at Puabic Pottery that's going to be later this summer. But before we go, I, I wanted you to say a little bit about um, your brother David and Dave Arney, which is how this all part of, part of how this all came to be. And we'll go out with some of that uh, tonight. So go ahead, Vic, if you want to say something there. Yeah, the two Daves, they probably got into a little trouble together they would come and hang out at my house. I remember one summer my parents were gone on vacation for a few weeks. So my former husband and I lived a few, quite a few miles away from my parents, but we were supposed to chaperone or make sure that my brother didn't have parties. And so my brother and Dave Arney knew that we were playing a concert at Meadowbrook that night. So we couldn't possibly get to the house till 11 o'clock. <laughs> so we got there at 11 o'clock and I walked in and someone said, oh, I, I picked up a beer and they said, you better put the beer away. The chaperones are coming. <laughs> I am the chaperone. Great. <laughs> evidently Great. there was a 
Dave Varney's rock band played a concert at our house that day. Wow. But wow. they had it pretty much cleaned up by the time we got there. <laughs> well, t tell us about the piece that's going to take us out of the program tonight, Rick. Yeah, Dave Varney is a, a great musician in, in, in his own right, uh, more of the rock style. Um, I like his playing. He wrote a song for my mom this past Christmas that he sent to her, and that's what you're going to hear today. He calls it The Life, but the saying we always had for Dave was he's living the life he almost lost, which is um, exactly what he did. He made the best of whatever his situation was, and he had a great life. Mm -hmm. Good. So we'll go out with He's Living the Life He Almost Lost, which was written and, and performed here by Dave Arney. <clears throat> I want to thank you both for the wonderful performance, and um, we'll look forward to hearing some more great music soon. Thank everybody for coming, and um, we'll look forward to seeing everybody soon. Good night. Bye-bye. in the books but his head was under the hood he's just a young man doing what he could he's moving fast but he about run out of track he's built to last and now he's coming back and living the life almost lost He showed us all that he could make it The finish line he will surely cross He's living the life he almost lost Standing tall It took a long time getting here but through it all, we watch those roadblocks disappear. He's doing well, he got a family of his own. Only time will tell, and he keeps marching on. And living the life that he almost lost. He's shown us all that he He's done the work and he's paid the cost He's living the life he almost lost Whoa, don't you know Life's touch and go Things don't always go your way Five years or more 
He's been in this fight It's time to go But only on his turn One more restless night And one more lesson learned He's living the life That he almost lost He's shown us all that we can make Life he almost lost. He finished the life he almost lost.